Welcome to Theology, Imagination and the Arts with me, your host, Daniel Cota Davis. Today's guest is Dr. William Lane Craig. It's wonderful to have you with us today. And our topic is the resurrection of Jesus Christ as a historical fact. So why is this important? Well, St. Paul himself said, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. So, Dr. William Craig, I want you to open up for us this question. I want to, you to first open up for us what the academic discussion surrounding the resurrection really is about. I think most of our audience would think, well, the New Testament scholars, they're just Christians who are propping up their own beliefs with perhaps spurious academic vanity. But is that actually what's happening? What is this academic yeah. field that you're in? Actually, that attitude is very naive and shows that these folks do not have much familiarity with the discipline of theology. Since the rise of classical liberal theology in the late 1800s, the most severe critics of Christian theism have been within the church, within the guild of theologians. Uh, and even with the demise of classical liberal theology at the end of the 19th century, the advent of so-called existential theology and dialectical th theology up through the mid 20th century was no more sympathetic to the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus or the historical value of the gospels than was classical liberal theology. But what has happened over the last half century or so has been a dramatic revolution within the field of New Testament studies, partly spurred on by uh, the, the so-called Jewish reclamation of Jesus, as scholars came to realize that the proper background for understanding Jesus of Nazareth was not, as previously thought, Greco-Roman pagan mythology. Rather, it is first century uh, Judaism. Jesus was a Jew. All of the disciples were Jews. And it's against that backdrop that the Gospels must be read and interpreted. And Jewish scholars began to appreciate that when you read the Gospels in that way, they begin to emerge as very credible historical sources for the life and teachings of this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And so it is simply not the case that New Testament scholars have been uh, biased and are just cheap apologists trying to shore up their faith. Rather, it has been the force of the evidence uh, that has wrought a very profound revolution within historical Jesus scholarship today, so that once again, the Gospels are viewed as valuable historical sources for the life and teachings of Jesus. Yes, I always um, love to think and we're talking about Yeshua Hamashiach, the son of Miriam. That's who we're referring to. So in this conversation about the resurrection, I think it's first important to establish what do we mean by historical fact? If we're going to say the resurrection is a historical fact, what do we mean by this? What criteria would historians agree on as to when something can actually be considered a fact? What is the burden of proof needed? Flowing from this, what proof would be needed if we were to be able to reach the conclusion in favor of Jesus historically rising from the dead? Mm -hmm. The resurrection of Jesus is such an extraordinary, singular event that you wouldn't think that there would be much historically to be said in support of it. But in my work in Germany, what I discovered is that the wide majority of New Testament critics today who are uh, students of the historical Jesus are largely agreed upon the central facts that undergird the inference to the resurrection of Jesus. Now, in speaking of historical facts, what we mean are events that actually happened. Uh, these are things that happened whether anyone believes in them or not. Even if no one knew about it, if it really happened, then that counts as a historical fact. And as historians weigh various historical hypotheses, they use different criteria to try to determine uh, what counts as a historical fact. And these would be 
criteria like explanatory power, explanatory scope, uh, plausibility, accord with accepted beliefs, degree of ad hocness, and and so forth. Um, And I would argue that when you weigh um, the central facts for the resurrection of Jesus, that the resurrection of Jesus emerges as the best explanation of these facts. So the burden of proof that you asked about will be comparative. It's it's what uh, philosophers call inference to the best explanation. You establish a body of facts to be explained, and then you compile a pool of live options Uh, live hypotheses for explaining these facts, and then these hypotheses are assessed on the basis of criteria, like the one that I listed. And one isn't trying to say that there's one that is mathematically certain or demonstrated to be true uh, above all the others. What one is saying simply is when you compare these historical hypotheses uh, using these criteria, that sometimes one hypothesis will emerge as the best explanation of the evidence. And my thesis is that the best explanation of the facts concerning the fate of Jesus of Nazareth is the one that the original disciples gave, namely, God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, Having said that, immediately we confront a historical problem. That is a supernatural explanation, isn't it? To say God raised Jesus from the dead. That posits a a miracle. And many historians would say that as historians, they are methodologically bound or restricted to considering only naturalistic explanations of the evidence. And therefore, they are methodologically prohibited as historians from drawing such an inference. Well, that's fine. What I would say uh, is in that case that what a historian can do is establish the essential facts to be explained, and then the historian in his off hours, so to speak, uh, the historian as a human being, Uh, or as a philosopher, can then draw the inference to the resurrection of Jesus as the best explanation, because as a human being, he is not bound by the professional methodological constraints that he is when he's speaking within his discipline. So in that sense, it might be misleading to speak of a historical proof for the resurrection of Jesus. I I think what we have good historical evidence for are the central facts about what happened after Jesus' death. And then I would say the best explanation of those, and that's a, a second step, would be the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead. And and that needn't be thought of as a historical hypothesis. That can be simply Um, a a philosophical hypothesis or metaphysical hypothesis that best explains what history can prove. I think it's interesting how you frame that, yes. So ultimately, all of these uh, historical options are going to point you towards a place where you're going to say, well, which one is the most reasonable? Right. And uh, I think that's one of the joys I have with your work is you're not afraid to say, well, which one is the most reasonable? And if this is actually true, then there's nothing to fear because we're actually just trying to understand history. This is the joy of it, is your approach is historical, which I just think is wonderful. So um, so perhaps you could set the scene for us in the context of Jesus' resurrection within the whole drama of the Old and New Testament found within the Bible. What are the main claims of Jesus about himself and the significant events of his life that afford him, first of all, to be considered a singularly important person of historical interest to historians? I think that this is a wonderful question that you're asking, because the meaning of any historical event is is going to be um, revealed only when it is considered in its historical context. An event without a context is inherently ambiguous. 
And so the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus needs to be considered within the wider historical context of this man's own unparalleled life and teachings. There is a general consensus among historians today that Jesus of Nazareth came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority. That is to say, the authority to stand and speak in God's place on matters uh, to which only God uh, would have authority to address. He claimed that in himself, the kingdom of God was breaking into human history, and as demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. Now, the modern skeptic might not agree that these were genuine miracles. Maybe they were psychosomatic healings. Uh, he might think that the cases of demonic exorcism were a mental illness, perhaps. But speaking as a historian, what we can say is that most historians, they recognize that Jesus of Nazareth made these radical claims about himself mm -hmm. and that he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. Whether you think they were authentic or not, these do belong to the portrait of the historical Jesus. In particular, I think he claimed to be the long-awaited Jewish Messiah, um, mm -hmm. who would be the ruler in Israel, the king of Israel. Uh, he claimed to be the son of God in a unique sense that set him apart from the Jewish king or holy men or other um, righteous figures. And he claimed to be the divine human son of man predicted in the seventh chapter of the uh, book of Daniel, uh, this divine human figure to whom God would give the nations of the world to serve and worship uh, and over whom he would be sovereign. And uh, at Jesus' trial, uh, where he's condemned by the Jewish high court, all of these claims come to a climax where he claims to be the Messiah, the mm -hmm. Son of God, and the Son of Man, and the uh, court votes for his uh, condemnation for blasphemy uh, immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, it was unambiguous. So this is the scene that is set here. If this man rose from the dead, yeah, if yeah. God raised this man from the dead, then those allegedly blasphemous claims have been dramatically and unequivocally vindicated by the God whom he had supposedly blasphemed. And so the resurrection would stand as God's divine imprimatur, as it were, of these yeah, yeah. radical personal claims made by Jesus of Nazareth. And it's, I always think about this. It's a very specific person who's been crucified. It's not just anyone. And perhaps the most radical things he says, the I am statements are so unambiguous because God's name is I am. Yes. <laughs> Bef the statement before Abraham was I am is nobody can say that. No one's thought of saying that. And this is a specific person saying that. And uh, I, how could it? <laughs> it's not only that you could conceive of saying this, but the thing for me is people actually believed him, like really believed him. The disciples were all martyred because they thought this was a good thing to say. The, the Jewish contemporaries of Jesus understood the implications of that claim, and mm -hmm. they took up stones to stone him to death because... All the time, from the beginning, from the beginning, I am the light of the world. I am the way to the truth and the life. I am the bread of life. These are the I am statements mm -hmm. that are taking the name of God. It's so unambiguous that it's that specific person we're crucifying and claiming uh, may have resurrected. So over the last 50 years, there has been an enormous transformation in New Testament studies, which you speak about. You have identified in your own work in this context that there are three central topics that are most important for successfully demonstrating the historical factuality of the resurrection, at least pointing towards yes. the, the place where you can make that conclusion. And you state these as being three things. The first, the post-mortem appearances of Jesus, mm 
Secondly, the discovery of the empty tomb. And thirdly, perhaps most extraordinarily, the disciples' belief that Jesus had risen from the dead. I would love it if we could go through each of these central topics in depth so you can open up for us their importance within an, an argument in favor of reaching the conclusion of the resurrection as a provable historical fact in the context that we've expressed. Yeah. So let's first begin with the central topic, that of the post-mortem appearances. What do you mean by this? Why are these appearances so compelling from a historical perspective and should not therefore be simply dismissed as legendary material? Mm -hmm. Virtually all New Testament critics today agree that after Jesus' crucifixion, various individuals and even groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive. Uh, and part of the evidence that goes to support this would be, number one, that Paul gives a list of eyewitnesses to these resurrection appearances in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that guarantees that such appearances occurred. New Testament scholars have shown that in this chapter, Paul is not writing freehand. Rather, he is passing on to the church in Corinth an old tradition that he himself received, and that probably goes back to within the first five years after Jesus' crucifixion. So these appearances cannot be dismissed as legends that accrued and developed over the decades and over the years. There simply wasn't time. Indeed, people were still alive uh, who could be asked about these uh, visions of Jesus that various individuals had seen. And so you can write these off as hallucinations if you want to. You can deny their veridicality and say these people were all hallucinating, but you can't deny responsibly that these events did occur. Paul's information has convinced virtually everybody that uh, after the crucifixion of Jesus, various individuals and groups did experience these appearances of Jesus alive. Secondly, the gospel accounts provide multiple independent attestation of these post-mortem appearances. This is one of the most important um, proofs of historicity that historians use. If you have independent accounts of the same event, at least one of which is early, then it's much, much uh, more likely that that event actually occurred than that these two independent sources independently came to make this up. And with regard to the appearances, these are uh, attested in some of the earliest New Testament sources that we have, like this information from Paul, but then also in the pre and story of the final week of Jesus' life, what is usually called the passion of Jesus. So these appearance stories have early, independent, multiple attestation, which counts for their historicity. And then the third point I would just like to mention would be that some of these appearances have earmarks of historicity. And I'm thinking, for example, of the appearance mentioned by Paul that, that Jesus, after his death, appeared to his younger brother, James. But then after the death of Jesus, after his crucifixion, we suddenly find that James emerges as a principal Christian leader in the early church and eventually becomes the sole leader of the church in Jerusalem. And from the Jewish historian Josephus, we learn that James was martyred for his faith in the mid-AD 60s during a lapse in the civil government, uh, martyred for his faith in Jesus. Now, that's extraordinary. What, what would it take to convince you that your brother is the Lord so that you would be willing to die for that and, and of the apostles, we're talking about 11 out of 12. I mean, from the Catholic perspective, we read the 
gospel on brother as being not maybe direct relation, but it still ah. it still carries the the uh, gravitas. Yes, I think I, of the situation, I, however you want to read that Greek. But no, yeah. the point being Fair that enough. it is is also very clear in the apostles, um, and not to segue, but surely I, I think you have said this several times, compared to other texts about historical events. This is so proximate. I could be wrong, but things like Plato, we're talking about hundreds of years later, and we accept as canon the statements that are made about these events that are so much earlier. This is kind of an unparalleled witness. Is that correct? Uh, yes. For example, uh, did you know that the earliest biographies that we have of Alexander the Great were written mm -hmm. by Arian and Plutarch 400 years after right. Alexander's yeah. death. Yeah. And yet classical Greco-Roman historians still regard these as largely reliable accounts of the life and exploits of Alexander. And in the case of Jesus of Nazareth, we have four different four, yeah. biographies of this man's life based on information that goes back to within first generation after the events, while the eyewitnesses were still alive. So this really is yeah. extraordinary. We have better evidence for the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth than we do for most uh, any other figure. And it of feels antiquity. like it's like name dropping contemporaries. Like these are famous people who are being name dropped into the witness testimony because it's like, go and talk to that person. I'm staking my reputation on this. I think you're quite right to point to the public nature of the empty tomb. These post-mortem appearances were private, uh, except those in groups. But the empty tomb of Jesus was a public fact that anyone in Jerusalem could investigate. One of the extraordinary things about the primitive belief in Jesus' resurrection is that it didn't originate in faraway Galilee or some other country. It originated in Jerusalem, in the very city where Jesus was publicly crucified in the eyes of his enemies and buried, and his tomb was known to both Jew and Christian alike. And so um, this is a publicly accessible fact at that time. Let me just mention briefly by way of outline some of the lines of evidence that undergird the historicity of the discovery of Jesus' empty tomb. First of all, the historical reliability of the burial story of Jesus supports the empty tomb. As I said, if the burial story is correct, then the site of Jesus' tomb was known in Jerusalem to both Jew and Christian alike. And in that case, it would have been impossible for a movement founded on belief in the resurrection of the dead man to arise and flourish in Jerusalem in the face of a tomb containing his corpse. And unfortunately for those who would deny the fact of the empty tomb, the burial account of Jesus is almost universally recognized as one of the earliest and best attested facts that we have about Jesus of Nazareth. Secondly, the discovery of Jesus' empty tomb is independently reported in multiple very early sources. This is that same criterion I spoke of before of early multiple independent attestation. We have no less than six independent sources for the empty tomb, some of which are among the earliest documents to be found in the New Testament. And that uh, provides very credible evidence for its historicity. Historians are, are they, they think they, that they've hit pay dirt if they have two independent early sources for an event. But in this case, we've got at least six. Thirdly, Mark's story of the discovery of the empty tomb is very simple, and it lacks signs of any legendary development. There is no theological or apologetical reflection uh, on the resurrection in Mark's empty tomb story. And the best way to appreciate this is to compare it with the accounts found in the later apocryphal gospels from the second half of the second century after Christ. Uh, for example, in the so-called Gospel of Peter, which was a forgery a, a century and a half later, Jesus comes out of the tomb 
sitting on the shoulders of gigantic angels whose heads reach up to the clouds and his head overpasses the clouds. And then after that, a cross comes out of the tomb and a voice from heaven says, hast thou preached to them that sleep? And the cross answers, yay. Now, yeah, well, that's right. how- And what in comparison, we have women whose testimony is worth nothing in court arriving on a specific day. And the person's tomb, to my knowledge, is a member of the Sanhedrin who condemned Jesus to death. Right. So it's uh, quite fact checkable. I mean, it's quite fact checkable. The discovery of the tomb by women uh, is uh, evidence in favor of its credibility. This one fact, the fact that women whose testimony was regarded as next to worthless in first century Jewish society should be the principal witnesses to the fact of the empty tomb, has convinced the wide majority of scholars that, in fact, it was women who went that Sunday morning and found the tomb empty. And then finally, I just want to add one fifth point, and that is that the earliest Jewish response to the preaching of the empty tomb presupposes the fact of the empty tomb. How did the earliest uh, Jewish authorities respond to the disciples' proclamation, he's risen from the dead? They said, the disciples came and stole away his body. Right. And to my knowledge, there doesn't exist a tradition of he's buried here. Some people claim he's buried here. I don't think that's attested to. No, nope. it's, it's not, no is it? No dispute about the location of the burial. The, the earliest yeah. Jewish response to the resurrection was to try to explain away why the body yeah. was missing. And so this Correct. is top drawer evidence for the historicity of the empty tomb because it comes from the very opponents of the early Christian movement. I, what I love about this now that I've understood a bit more what you're doing is that you're leading people to try and make a conclusion, which is fun in a way, because this leads me to the third point, which yes. I think is the hardest one to explain. Mm-hmm. How do Palestinian Jews end up believing a historical figure is God, I guess, would be the ultimate conclusion, God incarnate. He has historically resurrected, which yeah. to my knowledge is an unprecedented event. That's Not only could this be the case, but we have been able to convince Jews of this who the Jew, in fact, this person was crucified along the way, but we've been able to convince Jews, not only Jews, pagans, <laughs> been able to convince Jews and pagans. And so I think, if I don't want to misrepresent how you said, but you talk about something like a mysterious X. So yeah. if we do not want to accept the conclusion of the historical resurrection of Jesus as being the conclusion, then we are left with a X, a mysterious X, that anybody who wants to provide a counter-argument must tell, give a sufficient reason for how any of these things happened in the history of ideas, in the history of the world, in the eventuation of a church that has spread to... The, how is this sociological reality, anthropological reality? How is any of this actually occurring? Because for any other historical event, we try and see what were the conditions within which this came to be. So I I just, I want you to please just give a sense of how the third thing, which is that the disciples of Jesus came to believe in the resurrection is such a strong thing in the argument, right? It's a very strong part of the argument. Well, it it really is extraordinary because we know that this movement, the Jesus movement, came into being in the middle of the first century. Now, why did it arise? Well, all scholars agree that it arose because of the conviction of these earliest disciples that God had raised Jesus from the dead. But where in the world did they come up with that belief? That belief was something that they believed in and were willing to go to their deaths for, despite every predisposition to the contrary. Think of the the situation the disciples faced following Jesus' crucifixion. Number one, their leader was dead, and Jews had no idea of a defeated and crucified Messiah. So the crucifixion of Jesus put a question mark behind any hopes they had entertained he could have been the Messiah. Secondly, according to Old Testament law, Jesus' crucifixion as a criminal exposed him 
as a heretic, a man literally under the curse of God. So the crucifixion was such a catastrophe for these disciples, not simply because their beloved master was gone, but because his crucifixion showed that, in fact, the chief priests and Pharisees had been right all, all along. For three years, they had been following a man under the curse of God. And then finally, number three, Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the general resurrection at the end of the world. The resurrection only was a corporate event that took place after human history had come to a, close, uh, to a close on the judgment day when God would judge the dead. And so there was nothing that would predispose these disciples to have this extraordinary and un-Jewish belief. And yet we know that they did yeah, come right. to believe this. And well, bear in mind, this is the belief that you were crucified for. You were be you, the belief was blasphemous, and it's what you're crucified for. Um, and just from a Catholic perspective, just as a joy for us, um, we see Peter as kind of the most, um, it's almost witty, like, who do you defer your authority in life? Well, we follow Peter because he rejected Jesus publicly and was uh, embarrassed to be with him, but then asked to be crucified upside down. It's like, who are you going to fight? Well, according to the Catholic tradition, he, he requested to be crucified crucified upside down, stating that he did not deserve to die like Jesus. So for us, it's uh, who do we um, think is a good witness to what might be true in the world? Well, I'll stake my bets on a man who asked to be crucified upside down for what he believes. And what's, what's critical here is that I'm not arguing that because they were willing to die for this belief, therefore the belief was true. Uh, right. No, lots I, of people I understand. Have been yeah. martyred for false beliefs. Rather, mm. the argument here is that this is an extraordinarily un-Jewish belief that they had no predisposition to accept, and therefore there needs to be some sort of causal explanation for what mm. would lead these people to adopt such an extraordinary and uh, un-Jewish belief. And that gets to this point of the mysterious X. That you correct, and I, I to be honest, I was saying these things, framing them specifically in the context that we've discussed, because it's within that context that these actions are so unparalleled. They don't make sense. They are it's mysterious X with someone crucified upside down for mysterious X. Do you see what I mean? It's not just a a bunch of people agreeing and they all had a comfortable life. The people who agreed about this all brutally died rather than rejecting it. So it's a mysterious X that has like the weight of blood as well, I would say. Yes, the, you, we cannot dismiss these as lies or fabrications that were made up. That is incompatible with uh, their willingness to die for the truth of these beliefs. And so today, yeah. skeptical New Testament scholars who do not accept the explanation of the resurrection but they do accept these three facts that we've been talking about are simply left with agnosticism. They, they are left with a hole in the middle of the first century, a hole in history that they cannot plug up because they reject miraculous explanations. But well, let's be let's go into that, I think, because that's the epistemology of rationalism, which has its own sort of empirical criteria. And we are using those because we are using oral traditions and historical documented sources. However, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and steel man the arguments that you could make from the 19th century onwards where that rationalistic tradition uh, comes to the fore, because it's a nice way to wrap up the conversation. So I think we can go through these and just see if we think that they are compelling arguments. And I think some of them are more compelling than other ones. So these are sort of plausible, rationalistic alternatives. I right. think in your work you state about four or five. Uh -huh. Do you want me to introduce them or do you just know them off uh, my You heart? go ahead and introduce them and I'll comment. Yeah, so I'm going to start with the top one. So this, for me personally, in apologetics, is the most obvious one, which is there's a conspiracy theory 
and the disciples have lied and corroborated. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the conspiracy theory, like all conspiracy theories, is not a good historical explanation. Let me just mention three deficits. Number one, it's anachronistic. It looks at the situation of the disciples through the rearview mirror of Christian history. And so thinks, well, of course, they could fake the resurrection, steal the body, and lie about the appearances. But that is not to put yourself in the footsteps of the first century Jews. As I explained earlier, uh, for Judaism, there is no resurrection within history. It only occurs after the end of the world. And therefore, the idea of stealing the body and lying about the resurrection would never have occurred to these first century Jews. Um, if your favorite Messiah uh, got himself crucified, you basically had two choices. You either went home or you got yourself a new Messiah. But in no other case from the first century before Jesus through the first century after him, do we have any in example of a Messianic movement who claims that its leader was raised from the dead and therefore the Messiah after all. Secondly, the theory is enormously implausible because of what you have been discussing. The disciples were willing to die for the truth of this belief, and that shows that they at least sincerely believe the truth of what they proclaim. Many people will die for a lie, but that's only because they believe it to be the truth. And this theory suggests- And you'd expect at least one of them to recant within that. You'd expect at least one to say, well, not for me, right? You know, yeah, like, right. Uh, I, I think this is a lie. I always have, sorry, not for me. You'd imagine one or two. They're yeah. all different personalities. They're different figures. They have different histories. They have different stories. Not all yeah. of them would be sort of up for it, I imagine. Yes. And, and then the last point I would just make is that this theory has weak explanatory power. Um, it doesn't really explain the origin of the disciples' belief that Jesus was risen from the dead. Instead, it's a denial that they held that belief. Uh, and that goes against all of the best evidence uh, that we have that these people really did believe the truth of the message they proclaimed. So there is no contemporary scholar that would hold to this conspiracy theory. This is a vestige of 18th century deism that is no longer on the table. So second argument uh, would be the apparent death argument. So this argument would be Jesus didn't die on the cross, which explains why he's alive. <laughs> so yes. it's an argument. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that this hypothesis is enormously implausible. The Roman soldiers responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus were professional executioners, and they knew how to ensure that their victims were really dead, uh, in particular through a spear thrust into the side of the crucified person to ensure uh, death. So I think there's no realistic chance that Jesus was taken down from that cross alive. But secondly, this theory also has very weak explanatory power. Even if Jesus were taken down alive and somehow managed to escape from the empty tomb in some way we don't know how and appear to the disciples, the appearance of a half-dead Jesus desperately in need of medical attention and bandaging would hardly have elicited them in them the belief that he was the risen Lord and the conqueror of death. I'm going to get through two more, and then I'm going to ask you what you think the best one is, even if there's another one, because these are the ones I've seen you yeah. refer to, to, at least in terms of historically made arguments from the rationalist movement. So the third one, and this is a compelling argument, I guess. It's You could make this argument that it's a hallucin, sorry, a hallucination based on trauma that does happen. Um, yes. And this explains the phenomenon of the belief. Yes, I think this is the only alternative hypothesis that has any credibility and is worth uh, talking about today. But I would argue that it's not as good an explanation for a number of reasons. Number one, it has narrow explanatory scope. It tries to explain the post-mortem appearances, but it has absolutely nothing to say about the empty tomb. 
Uh, in order to explain the empty tomb, you have to conjoin another hypothesis to the hallucination hypothesis, and therefore that will be a less simple explanation than the resurrection hypothesis. It also, secondly, has weak explanatory power. It cannot really explain the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. As I said, uh, the resurrection contradicted Jewish beliefs. Had the disciples hallucinated visions of Jesus after his death, there is a category in Jewish thinking that would have been perfect for explaining that, and that is that Jesus had been assumed into heaven, um, and there he appeared to them from the heavenly realm. That would be consistent with Judaism, but the disciples didn't proclaim the assumption of Jesus into heaven. Instead, they uh, proclaimed his resurrection from the dead in contradiction to Jewish beliefs. And then thirdly, the um, hypothesis, I think, is enormously implausible. The idea that you could have group hallucinations uh, of Jesus and this series of um, hallucinations would be unparalleled in the psychological case books. Uh, the only thing you could do would be to try to cobble together different uh, hallucinatory experiences, but there's no other case where you would have a series of these sorts of visionary experiences to both individuals and groups. And so this breaks But to my knowledge, even if you were to, even if you were able to make that sort of psychological evaluation, you're still at the first problem of the first argument, which is where's the body? Yes. And so we're talking about weighing this explanation by the various criteria that historians use and it will fail some tests worthy more than others. I think the explanatory scope is a really serious problem, but I also think it fails for the reason I explained, the criterion of plausibility as well. So I'm going to be honest with you here because I've seen you laugh at this fourth one. I actually think it's the most plausible one because at least oh, it gives do? a an under... Oh. No, I do because I know you think it's funny, but... It actually gives you a reason for why a human being who looks like Jesus is walking around, which the other uh -huh. ones don't. Because we're talking about, do you try and see what I'm saying? It's actually making the point of a historical resurrection because at least you've got a human being in front of you who's alive who looks like Jesus. It's not a hallucination. It, expl oh, it doesn't explain why the body's not there, though, does it? They stole the body well, and then the twin well came? The, the well, advocate, just the argument is, is that he has a twin and the twin comes twin and brother. convinces the disciples that he's Jesus. Yeah. But that gives and, you a reason for why you've got someone who looks like Jesus physically yeah. in front of you. That's the point I'm making, because they're saying it's a physical thing. Right. And, and you, the, the theory has to be finessed very carefully. You have to say that Jesus yeah. had an identical twin brother, but that he was separated from Jesus quickly yeah. after birth and grew up yeah. somewhere else independently so that nobody knew about him. Nobody knew Jesus yeah. had this twin brother. And he came back to Jerusalem just about the time of the crucifixion, and he stole Jesus' body out of the tomb. Oh, he and stole he, Jesus' he body. Stole oh, I see. And okay. presented himself to the disciples, yeah. hey, here I am, and they mistakenly inferred it was Jesus risen from the dead. I, now, the thing is, it still has the problem of the missing body. You're right. It has the, If we throw away the problem of the missing yeah. body, the point I'm trying to make is it gives an account for a physical understanding of historical resurrection because the other ones yeah. don't try and do that because they might explain why the tomb's not there. But at least this one that's kind of funny to think of gives you a reason for why you could touch this person. They're actually in front. You see what I mean? The other ones can't yeah. be a hallucination. I, I you mean, can't, really, can't. It's, it's, a, it's a fancy form of the conspiracy theory, really. It's the it theft a of the body form. and yeah. lying about it. Uh, but the, the, the most serious problem with this is, like all conspiracy theories, it's enormously ad hoc. Uh, and mm -hmm. when you indict a theory for being ad hoc, you mean that it has no independent evidence in its favor. It's just made up to be tailored to the facts. And so this theory... So in, in all sincerity, we've gone through these, but what is the best one today, would you say? Because there, are there other ones? Those are the ones okay. I know. Well, the best one would be a version of the hallucination hypothesis based upon bereavement visions. Mm -hmm. 
that people often have of loved ones. And these are extraordinary events. A, a wife might see her husband in the living room and he would appear there very physical to her, uh, not like a dream or hallucination, but but she would see her husband sitting there in the in the living room and they might chat with each other and she might even touch him uh, and, and feel his body, but then he'll disappear, you know, and, and it'll turn out it was just a, a vision of the uh, deceased loved ones. And these bereavement visions, I think, are really extraordinary. And I could imagine a hypothesis whereby one would say that the disciples, um, because of their closeness to Jesus, even though he wasn't a family member, they, they loved him. And so after he was crucified, they experienced these bereavement visions of Jesus and mistakenly thought he was risen from the dead. And I think that's but more... where's the body? Where's the body Yeah, in you that? see, you've still got that problem yeah. with the empty Because the where's the body is actually the historical point of the gospel, I would say, is where's the body? Where's the body is a big part of the story. However, putatively, you might suggest maybe some of these people had those bereavement visions. Do you see what I mean? Maybe oh, some people well, had bereavement I mean, visions. Not impossible. And maybe some of them didn't. Like, the, the point is, is not all of them, surely, right? All these different... Do you see what I mean? Yeah, oh, it, absolutely, it, it, I do. I mean, you know, yeah. in Matthew, you have in chapter 27, I believe, the claim that many people in Jerusalem saw Old Testament saints risen from yeah. the dead. And I could well imagine that those were from just visionary experiences, you know, that that weren't uh, veridical. Uh, so what you're saying is, is correct. It, it could be that some were like that. But um, it would be, I think, impossible to say that it was that that's the full explanation. All, it's the of all of them, isn't it? It's the all of them. What I like about that argument is that it actually respects the integrity of the voice that we're receiving, because it respects the fact that if you read these texts, they don't look like any other literature really in the world. The people who are speaking are gentle and compassionate people. They don't talk like a lot of other people. And these people are making pretty unextraordinary statements about extraordinary events, but they're not written in sort of a manipulative way or with some kind of right. underlying, easy to see hermeneutic of control or ideology or anything. No. Maybe some people well, might argue they do, but the bereavement trauma theory at least respects the author, I would say, in the context of them loving the person they're talking about, yes. which seems to be the whole point of the thing within the context of messianic judaism as well as these texts start to reappropriate the old testament witness as ways of understanding this person they met who they love I, I i've never heard that argument but i feel like at least it respects the author yes i agree yeah so well thank you i've got a few things to ask just one more uh, interview question which is all of this said and done, the normal Christian, let's say, who has not studied like a historian as you have, how would you advise them to get this point across? Because it's a really important point. I think it can be a really good bridge. Like, you tell me how it happened. That's sort of the spirit, isn't it? If you don't think it happened, tell me what happened or something like that, right? What I would encourage our average Christian layman to do is to memorize these three facts that are agreed uh -huh. upon by the wide majority of New Testament scholars today. This is this is the strength of the argument. This is not something that conservatives uh, only believe in. This represents the wide majority view today. And so, what you what the average Christian can say is that the wide majority of historical scholars today believe that uh, number one, uh, after his burial, Jesus' tomb was discovered empty by a group of his women followers on the first day of the week. Number two, that thereafter various individuals and groups experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead. And number three, uh, that various uh, disciples, despite every predisposition to the contrary, sincerely and suddenly came to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead. And uh, and then say, I, I can't think of any better explanation of those three facts uh, 
than the one that the disciples themselves gave. God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, there you've got like a 30-second apologetic for the historicity of the resurrection that I think is very powerful. And something that would give me a lot of joy, so I'm going to recommend it in humility with uh, compassion, let's say. Alex O'Connor. I've got a lot of time for Alex O'Connor. He was a Catholic. Now he's searching like St. Augustine. He's a He's into epistemology, he's into naturalistic arguments, he has that trauma thing about death, and he's a cosmic skeptic, all that. Um, could you find it within a conversation to pose those questions to the very clever Alex O'Connor? Because I don't know if he can answer those questions. Those are the questions you need to ask Alex O'Connor. He's very um, notional, but this is a concrete historical what you've just said to me, no. please ask Alex O'Connor no. those questions, but really ask them. The Don't let him wiggle. I'll, I'll, Don't let him wiggle. Don't let him wiggle. He's gonna I, 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 I discussed these very facts with Ben Shapiro, who is... Yes, I saw that. I saw uh, that. Yeah. I would be happy to talk about these with Alex as well. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you. It's been great to be with you today. You take care. Thank you. Bye.